I know it's already been mentioned a couple of times, but it's, uh, it's uh, worth mentioning again. What a great VBS program. And the church said? Amen. That's right. Certainly we appreciate uh, Bonnie Bella for coordinating. She was the coordinator for this year's uh, edition, along with uh, Celestia Bennett, who handled the details from the office. And there are a lot of details, trust me. Uh, I have to say, the best puppet program, right? Man, what a great puppet program. A lot of people participating. Uh, Debbie, of course, Kessler was the coach. Uh, terrific job there, and the kids really were, they were so into it, so excited to see the uh, puppets. A great program. Super involvement by so many members in the areas of teaching, decorating, activities, snack prep, security, crafts, the AV guys in the booth who were miking, uh, you know, running around miking all the, the people, uh, and then the mystery cookie Zorro, whoever he was, wandering around. <laughs> and a special thanks to our youth group for serving in every area. I think that was really important. Saw them serving in every area, participating in the skits, guides, you know, everywhere they were serving, a great thing. Uh, I didn't know how many, uh, someone said over 80 people, 80, 85, easy to believe, so many people in the congregation participating uh, in, in for, you know, managing the kids and teaching, so on and so forth. And I was greatly encouraged by our theme, the mystery of Christ, because it was teaching this over 150 children that attended every night, it was teaching them the core gospel, the core gospel. And we were following the course set by Paul the Apostle when in referring to his young assistant Timothy said, and we had the reading just a moment ago, and I'll read it again, from an early age you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus, 2 Timothy 3.15. Timothy, learned God's word from his faithful grandmother, Lois, and also from his faithful mother, Eunice, both raising him up and teaching him God's word. No VBS in those days. Because of them, Timothy became a Christian, first of all, and then a missionary, helping Paul the apostle in his work, and then finally an evangelist, preaching and building up the church, amazing record of this young man from an early age, we see him, we hear about him into adulthood and how he was effective in the, in the church. And in the same way, this past week, we have seen grandmothers and grandfathers and even great grandmothers and great grandfathers and parents and uncles and aunts and others bringing children to VBS four nights in a row all very tiring, rushed suppers, late bedtimes, but seeing the looks of joy and excitement on the children's faces, all the effort was worth it. And I said, you know, man, it's going to go late. Last year we finished at eight. This year, you know, the teacher said, give us more time to do our crafts and that. And we'll finish at 8.40 and by the time you get out of here, it's past nine o'clock. And I said, you know, there was some discussion as to should we dial it back, should we shorten it? And finally the decision was, no, let's just do it. Let's just do it because people will vote with their feet. If it's too long, too tiring, they'll just won't come back. Well, they came back, all right, with more and more. Every night we had more kids. And so next, next year we're going till 10 p.m. It's going to be, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy. I am persuaded that God is pleased when we are consciously leading our children to Jesus Christ. Because He said, let the children alone and do not hinder them from coming to me, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these, Matthew 19, 14. And we were certainly in this kind of spirit, in the spirit of the kingdom of heaven here this week. So in the end, this is what VBS is all about. It's about leading our children to the knowledge of the gospel so that they are introduced to it at the earliest age possible. And you have succeeded in doing this. 
you who worked through the inconvenience to bring children, and you who worked through the fatigue to teach them, God bless you and God bless you all. Of course, one VBS doesn't complete the task, obviously. There's always more to do in teaching and training our children in preparation for not only adulthood, but for Christian adulthood. Parents, boy, I wish we'd remember that. It's, we're not just training them for adulthood, we're training them for Christian adulthood. And so this morning, therefore, I'd like to propose to you three very important things that all kids need to know if they are to grow up to become well-balanced adults leading faithful Christian lives. Just three. Three things kids need to know. Number one, kids need to know how to know. Kids need to know how to know. There was a time, maybe 150 years ago, that a well-educated person could learn pretty much all he or she needed to know with a well-rounded education. This is because there was a generally definable limit to the information available in any given area and a bright person could, with training, master most of it. But in the last 50 years, however, the rate of new information available on any given subject has increased faster than it has in the previous 1900 years. Understand what I'm saying? 1900 years of accumulating information about various topics. In the last 50 years, we've accumulated more information about everything than we have in the previous 19 centuries. In other words, the pace of increased information is such today that what you learn in college may become obsolete by the time your diploma is one year old. You know, I remember back in the 70s and 80s, that's the 1970s and 80s, people who studied to be graphic artists, remember graphic artists and draftsmen, they had much of their training and skills replaced by a computer program that produced their work 100 times faster than the conventional hand-drawn method, all in the space of one decade. All of these people were out of work. They had to retrain, find new ways to do the same job they'd been doing for decades. You see, today, kids need to learn how to find the knowledge that they need from the vast pool of information that is ever increasing. And once they learn how to find what they're looking for, they need to be trained in how to select the information that is the most useful, the most applicable, and the most true in the context of their search. It has been said that knowledge is power. Well, this was true in a world where knowledge was compact and access to it was limited because of ignorance and poor communication tools. Yeah, that was true once. But in the future, the one who knows how to find and how to analyze specific knowledge in the universe of information around us, that person will be the person that has power. So what do we need to teach our kids? We need to teach them how to know, how to find. Secondly, kids need to know the true God. Notice I put that second, you think I, you know, as a preacher I would have put that first, but you'll see what I'm talking about by putting this second. With the, prolification, with the proliferation rather, and multiplication of information comes a dizzying array of philosophies and religions and cults and beliefs, both old and new. It took 400 years for primitive apostolic Christianity to apostate into Roman Catholicism. It took 600 more years for Catholicism to split into two branches, East and West. It took another 600 years for the Protestant Reformation to take shape and then still another two centuries for Protestantism to give way to denominationalism that existed by the beginning of the 20th century. Now, I'm just talking about a few you know, a few splits there, 2,000 years. 
But in the last 100 years, however, we've added thousands of religious groups, all claiming to speak, to know, to act on behalf of God or their personal image of God. There are subcategories of subcategories of subcategories, and this is only within Christianity. The same thing is happening in the other, quote, so-called world religions of Hinduism and Islam and Buddhism. They're splitting, they're splitting, they're splitting, they're fighting, they're fighting, they're fighting. The religious world is so fractured that in the future, a person's search for God will be more daunting than ever before. And that's if he even tries to find Him at all. That's the problem with the multiplying of religion. It tends to discourage those who seek God. You know, there's so much out there, people say, you know what, it's all the same, you know, who, who needs it? Can't be true, or maybe some of it's true. It's just too hard to know. But those of us, however, who practice biblical Christianity understand that God, the true God, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God who sent Jesus His Son, the God who reveals Himself through His Word, the Bible, those of us who know God know this about Him. We know that He has created man in such a way that man yearns to find the truth about what is beyond himself. Solomon says it in this way, God has set eternity in their heart. Ecclesiastes 3.11, God has wired us to search for Him. Even with the confusing array of options, the kids of today, like every kid before, will yearn to know the true God and search to find Him. And this is so because without a sense of God, without a knowledge of the true God, the kids of today, armed with all of the powerful technology and information that the 21st century affords, will grow up to arrive at the very same dead end that the wisest man of Israel's golden era came to at the end of his life almost 3,000 years ago. Solomon, genius of the times, innovator, builder, writer, thinker, ruler, wrote of his one of a kind of experience. He said, vanity of vanity, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. There's the fatigue of searching through the knowledge of this world. It brings only vanity. And then he said at the very end of Ecclesiastes, the conclusion when all has been heard is, fear God and keep His commandments because this applies to every person. Every person seeks for God, every person needs God. You see, advances in technology and information never outstrip a person's need to know the true God, because these things only affect our physical lives. Kids today need to know the true God because no matter how much they learn about the world around them and themselves, the proper context for all of it doesn't come into view until it is seen in the presence of the living and holy God. If you don't know who God is, you can't make sense of this world. That's the problem. That there is an ever increasing mountain of information, this is new. But that there is no end to the knowledge and learning, this is not new. God revealed this to Solomon 3,000 years ago. In Ecclesiastes 12, verse 12, he says, but beyond this, my son, be warned. It's a warning, he says. The writing of many books is endless, and excessive devotion to books is wearying to the body. A mountain of information simply makes you tired. Our children will need to know God in order to make sense of this world and understand their place in it. And this is our great challenge as parents and as a church. We spend so much time preparing them to be adults, special classes, special sports program, training, making sure they know how to write the SAT, get them into the right college, you know, socialize them and so on and so forth, and that's good. But if they don't know who God is, and if they don't have a relationship with the Lord, they won't be able to make sense of all of this. 
And so our little VBS there, in our little family here, that's one of the efforts we're making to help them make sense of this world through a vision of Christ. And I encourage us to keep, to keep doing that, and not to be afraid and grow weary in doing these kinds of things. All right, one other thing I want to mention. What kids need to know? Kids need to know about love. They need to know about love. By the time modern kids grow up to be adults, the genetic code of human beings having been mapped out will provide a completely new way of treating and preventing diseases. Plants, animals, even humans will be routinely modified through genetic engineering. Machines will look, sound, and act more and more like human beings and because of this, in the future, when these little ones grow up and they're our age, old style nationalism based on language and culture will begin to fade as the new dividing lines will be drawn between what is considered to be human and biohuman. In other words, the future clashes will be over the definition of what is human and not what color you are or what language you speak. That's oh so 20th century. This sounds like science fiction, doesn't it? It sounds crazy, but this is where we're going. It'll be what modern kids today will have to deal with when they will be our age in the tomorrows to come. In a world we can't even contemplate now, what language, what common currency will transcend the time and the innovations of the society of the future? In a word, love, love. Let me give you an example of how love transcends time. If somehow I could go back, you know, time machine, I could go back to the year 30 AD and I could enter the Jewish society of Jesus' day and sit with the elders at the gates of the city of Jerusalem and speak with the mighty thinkers of that time. And if I could do this and describe to them the world in the year 2014, you know what, I think they just couldn't imagine it. I think I could not even find words in their language to try to convey concepts like electricity, or television, or rocket ship, plastic, how do you explain plastic, or virtual to a you know, 30 AD man. They would think that I was a lunatic. They would think I'd be possessed by a devil. However, if I explain to these very same men at the gates of the city about my grandchildren, how God had blessed my wife and I with nine precious, beautiful grandchildren, all of them healthy, all of them in families where there is love and commitment one to another, if I shared with them how proud we were as we watched them grow up in the Lord and in the love we feel for each of these grandchildren. If I told them about that, a grandfather delighting in his grandchildren. If I said that to other fathers and grandfathers, then the thousands of years and all the barriers between us would vanish. Because no matter what, the language of love and the concept of love is timeless. Timeless. And so today's kids they need to know what love is. They need to see it. They need to experience it. They need to be taught how to express it. They must be encouraged to set love as the high watermark for their relations with others and themselves, regardless of the type of world that they live in. Parents often worry because they can't keep up with what modern kids do or what they listen to or what modern kids know. And with the avalanche of new and newer ideas and technologies ever upon us, it's getting almost impossible for parents to keep up. You know, what today's kids need, however, is not parents who know about everything they know. What they, the kids, need is the security of their parents' love so that they can cope with the crazy world that they live in. You may not be able to match your kid's prowess in using a computer or an iPad, but if you teach him or her how to love, 
you'll have equipped them for life here or on any planet they choose to live on in the future, if they know how to love. So when we think about these things that I've mentioned this morning, how do we fit what we are doing here in Choctaw with the kind of broad strokes you know, that I've outlined in this lesson about kids and in the future? In other words, so what? How does that apply to us as a congregation? Well, there can be a definite relationship if, first of all, here in Choctaw, we're training our kids to know how to know by encouraging their education, encouraging their experimentation, by providing, surely, computers, opportunities for sports, activity, all that kind of stuff you parents provide, that's a good thing. And in doing that, today's parents are helping today's kids explore the world of abundant options. My only advice in this area would be to allow them to try, allow them to fail, allow them to think. Don't give them all the answers. Today's kids need to learn how to search and a wise parent will exercise patience during their slow and painful process. You're also definitely helping your children if, here in Choctaw, we're leading our children to the knowledge of the eternal God. And of course, it's what we all want. This congregation should never apologize for the time and money spent on children's education programs and the resources that we supply for this group. We're, we're hiring a youth and family minister. That's an expensive proposition. It was expensive to do the search in time and money and it's expensive to the budget to bring on another person, but it's worth it. It's worth it. From the time they are babies to adulthood, they should be taught and molded and directed to know only the true and eternal God and His Son, Jesus Christ. And anything that we spend contributing to that knowledge is money well spent. The rest of the world may doubt, the rest of the world may be confused, but we have fulfilled prophecy. We have an empty grave. We have the eyewitness of the apostles and we have an unassailable record in the Bible about who the true God is. We know who He is. We should never be ashamed of the gospel because through it we bring our children into the presence of the eternal God through faith in Jesus Christ and everything we do towards that is worth it. No matter what kind of world the kids of today will live in tomorrow, they will bring into that world the knowledge of God and the good news of Jesus Christ with them because of you. Because of you. I've said it before, these little kids after church, you know, they make you crazy, they, they're running up here. Anywhere where there are steps, that's where they are. You know, Bob Aldridge and the, and the guys built a ramp back there, you know, a slanting ramp, you know, wheelchair access. And my first thought was, uh-oh, another spot where the kids are going to have to be able to run up and down. Well, those children will be in this pulpit in the future. And those children will be the ones taken off to do mission work. And those children will be the ones teaching the future children. How well are we preparing them for that task? How much of an investment have we made? Remember, you don't get out anything more than what you put in. So if we put in a lot, we'll get back a lot. Then finally, here in Choctaw, our children absolutely need to learn how to love. How to love God through obedience and through worship. How to love each other through fellowship and service and evangelism. How to love themselves from the positive reinforcement and, and environment that we provide here. You know, I heard someone talking about VBS once, a teacher, an experienced Bible school teacher. It was, a, it was a lady and she was saying, you know, the number one thing that children learn at VBS isn't so much the books of the Bible or who Moses was. They learned that too. The most important lesson that they learn is that when they go to this place called church, that's where love is. That's where love is. At home there may be tension and yelling. At school and with the brothers, brothers and sisters there may be some fussing. But when they come to this place, this is the place of love. This is where I am loved, 
unconditionally by people I don't even know hardly, but they love me here. And this is a place of safety. And this is the thing they carry. And some people say, you know, I wonder why, you know, kids grow up, sometimes they wander away from the church, and then they come back. I wonder why they come back. You think it's because of doctrine they come back? Well, yes, you know, intellectually, but the reason why many come back is that they didn't find that thing there. They didn't find it at the job. They didn't find it in sports. They didn't find it in activities. They didn't find it out in the world, this thing where I come to this place of love. That's why it's so important that we teach them how to love. And so regardless of the shape of the future, there will always be sinfulness in the world. Greed and pride and lust will always mar any utopic society that man tries to create with his own ingenuity. But your kids and my kids are inoculated against the destruction caused by sin in this and every generation because you have set the love of Christ in their hearts that will become in their time what it has been in our time and every time throughout history. His love is the light in this dark world. His love is the light in this dark world. Not just this in a general sense, but His love will be the light in their dark world in their dark moment. What you are doing in teaching them is lighting that light, that kind of pilot light, so that it is always burning, so that they will always know where the light is. The light is always where Jesus is, and Jesus is always where His people are, and His people are in this place. Guide them into Christian service, or it will help them find again the place where love is. And so you send them forth as the light of the future, leading the way for all those who will seek the true and living God. If we teach our kids these things, we will have done well and we can have hope for their lives and their souls in the years to come. And so as I close this morning, please review carefully what you have taught and what you will teach your children. And as you think of these things, also remember what God has taught all of us, young and old, that those who believe and those who obey His Son Jesus will have a future with no end of joy. And those who disbelieve will suffer a future never ending with darkness and with despair, Mark 16 and 16. Let us therefore respect the Lord's teaching by obeying His commands. If there's anyone here, young or old, that needs to obey the gospel, in other words, repent and be baptized, please don't hesitate and don't wait. Do that this morning. And if there's anyone here that needs to follow the light homeward and receive the prayers of welcome of the church, we encourage you to do that as well this morning as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.